well, the viewers wouldn't see this, but in, in, in Marvin's window, he has 2023 100-meter world champion as his name. <laughs> I just have Simple Anson. Joining us on Sprint to Views today, the World Championship silver medalist in the 100 meters, the World Championship bronze medalist in the 60 meters, a former NFL player, an Olympian once, probably could have been twice, <laughs> yo, big it up for the one and only yes, sir. Marvin Bracey. Marvin Bracey, what's up, my guy? What's going on, dog? How you doing, man? I see that you're hoodied up today, and I'm very flattered. Yeah, I had to. You know, I got to represent, man. I'm on a platform. Got to get my answer on. Oh, I respect. I remember the first time I saw you, right? I don't remember what race it was. I think it was an indoor race, actually. I was like, hmm, all right. This dude has some real talent, yo. And then I uh, started asking some questions. And then I heard that you played football. And you're kind of flirting with playing football again. And I was like, oh, well, shit. He's going to have some flashes of performance. But I don't know if he's going to be able to maximize. So tell me what you think about this statement. Marvin Bracey is a football dude. He's never going to be the guy. I mean, I laughed at it. I mean, clearly I'm not a football dude. You know, should I, I didn't make it. So I'm right where I need to be. Why do you think you didn't make it in football? By the time I got there, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, I was just so far behind pace. You know, learning the plays, you know, learning how camp goes, all of that. But what it really all boils down to is I just, I just wasn't good enough. Look at Devin. Devin walked away from the sport, you know, still had a little bit of that football in him, you know, walked back onto a team and at least made the practice squad. I know what an NFL camp is like. He went in there and beat, you know, seven, eight, nine guys out of a spot that's probably already, that probably played college football and came straight into the league, not been running, you know, hurdles for the last three, four years, and then trained a little bit, and then came into this locker room. To be honest with you, those guys don't like that. The football guys don't like that. Yeah, think about it. Let's just say some, you know, some soccer dude walking on the street, like, you know what, man, I think I'm a sprint. And the next thing you know, you know, he's amongst us. You're like, hold on now. <laughs> you know, shouts out to him, man, being able to, you know, come from this, train, do both, and then go and play football and actually get on the team. Because these dudes are come, like steadily getting better. These football players be yapping all the time, dog, about jumping into track. Why is it that they see that this is even something that could be said? Yeah, well, see, think about it. Like, at the end of the day, football athletes, track athletes, basketball, soccer, everybody technically can run. Like, they, they think it's just running. Like, they don't realize, especially in the 100, it's a little bit more technical than that, like, but they don't understand that. Um, how many NFL players did you beat in the 40-yard dash? Uh, 40 minutes? Every one of them. That's, you beat Tariq? That's not a question. So everybody runs. In basketball, they run suicides and run sprints and stuff like that. In football, they run you know, down the field and stuff like that. But in 100 meters, I will take a lot of our women over some of the top NFL guys because <laughs> they don't understand that they, they run 40 yards. But you, <laughs> you got a long way to go. Tell me something. Do you think track guys are soft? Okay, soft as in, do you mean just soft by nature or like, I don't even know, like, do you mean like mentality? Like, what do, what do, you, what do you mean soft? You played football. You've done both sports. Right. So from a mentality standpoint, you know, what differences stand out? If it, The thing is with football, you're getting 11 guys on the field at the same time that are basically on one accord, where at least we think we on one accord. We at least know like all that, you know, that drama, that all, you check that shit, it's dope, bro. Like we ain't even... <laughs> We're not doing that. You know, whatever you got going on, ain't got nothing to do with us in here, man. You come in here, you couldn't work. Like with track, like it's just because it's on us, you kind of got to face your demons or whatever you want to call it. Like you got it, whatever you up against, you kind of got to face it because this is all mental. You know what I'm saying? Mentally, like, you know, some people check out when you get to, when you get to that line and, you know, we know that, you know how that goes. You're out there by yourself. It's all on you. It's got to be a different level of pressure when you when you're in that spot explain what an option year is okay so an option year is like basically like a bonus year in your contract i was signed for 
three years with an option year for a fourth. So after my third year of my contract, Nike can figure out, you know, if they want to renegotiate another contract or I would, you know, be free to go somewhere else to negotiate a contract. I mean, you can make the team, get a medal, do what you got to do, or you can kind of play them out. This year, obviously, you know, making a team, running 9-8, getting a medal, um, all that stuff matters. So, you know, now we come to the table and they say, okay, well, you've done this. So this is what we're willing to offer or somebody else can offer something. If you're at the top, right? You're good. You're cool. But if you fall to that point where you're like top ish, it gets murky. It's real murky. It's real murky. And top ish is still really good. There's some really good athletes in the top ish <laughs> section, dog. It, it, it can make a break. It can change so many things, open so many doors. Because think about top ish, you're in the finals. You know, you're a metal threat. You run nine seconds. That's, you know, top ish. That's very fast. They pay for medals and stuff like that you know so after world champs my agent sent me a new schedule you know my schedule coming out and i'm all i see is appearance for appearance for appearance for i'm like good god they paying this to run like <laughs> i've been missing out <laughs> I've, been miss, I've been running for free all this boy look at here so that's the difference between top and top ish you really had to make something happen <laughs> man who's bracy is it your dad or your mom my mom gave me my dad's first and middle name and her last name. So Marvin Antoine Bracey. Backstory, my dad died when I was 10. He died, yo, he died when I was 10, got shot by a cop. I was in, uh, so it was, two, it was January 15th, 2004. I was in the fourth grade and my mom never came to the school, never. Like no PTSA conferences, no, none of that. I remember they called me to the office and it was like, oh, your mom up here. I said, okay, cool. So I go to the front office. I'm like, you know, what the hell? When I walked in there, she was crying. So I'm like, yo, what's that? Like, you know, what you, like, what's going on? And she them telling me, like, he died. And I just looked at her, like, stone face, like, <laughs> what? They had rushed him to the hospital and he died on the way. Do you remember him? I definitely remember him. You know, he wasn't a bad person, nothing like that. I mean, I was well aware of, like, you know, a lot of what he had going on and, you know, just the street life and stuff like that. He was around, but, like, I, I lived with my mom. When I got older and I realized I was having a son, I was like, you know what? Like, it would be dope to share, you know, all of us to share a name just so, like, his name kind of lives on a little bit. But I had me my name as Marvin Bracey. So if I came back as just Marvin Williams, they wouldn't know who the hell I am. So I just kept the Bracey and just tagged on the Williams. And so now my son is the third. Like, we call him Trip, but his name is Marvin Bracey Williams the third. That's a huge impact on how you are as a father then. You try to go extra hard for, you know, the opportunity that you lost. But who's to say, you know, I would be who I am if I had, you know, that guidance or this, that, and that. Like, I don't know. Hey, does your um, does your son know or understand who you are? No. Like, he don't realize that everybody's dad is not on TV. And, and, I, and I like it. I, I love it, man, because, like, having a different perspective, when I walk through the door after practice or after a meet, like, he's just happy to see me. He'll ask me, hey, dad, uh, did, did, did you win? Y'all won, dog. Okay, good job. And that'd be it. That's all, that's all we talk about. You know, that's, that's as far as the conversation goes. At the very end of the day, track is what I do. I'm a dad when I walk in the house, you know. I'm a dad when I take him to school. You see a lot of uh, similarities in your son and in you? <laughs> They tell you to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I always said I wanted a son just like me, bro. It's like, oh my God, it's carbon copy. I'm the only consistent male that he really has in his life. So his mannerisms and everything he talks, the way he walks, talks, like everything is like me because this is all he sees. It's cool to see because I, I always wanted to see myself. One, two, three. <laughs> How's being a dad changed you? It made me a lot more mature. Uh, it made me a lot more aware. And um, it just does something to you, just like the, just does something to like the psyche. But like my son, like day one, like from the day, from the time he was this big to like watching him be born to watch him now, man, like you start to see yourself and it kind of like, it, 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 it can expose you. It can show you just kind of like, you know, where you're weak at because you'll see him do certain things and you're like, damn, why would he do that? Well, that's what he see you do. 
Um, and then I get to, you know, I get to enjoy this journey again. I got a daughter coming. She should be here in December. Well, congrats, so, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. So that, that made the option year even more stressful. Like, I'm just sitting there like, man, hey, listen, but you ain't, you ain't got no choice. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that you got expelled when you were in grade three. How does a grade three, how does a grade three get expelled, dog? Grade three? Grade, yeah, third grade, man. Um, I think you were like, you like eight in third grade or something like that. Yeah. I think I told the teacher to like kiss my ass or something. And um, they suspended me for two days. Came back to school, and then this girl she tried to take a book from me, and I don't I, I don't know why I did it, bro. Like I threw it at her. Um, I'm pretty sure it hit her. I could have like I could have like I ain't really have to throw it at her, but I was like, if you want to, if you want it so bad, you know, she here take it, and I threw it. She just seen me, wrote me up, suspended me for two more days. I came back that Monday, and I for, I think because of, because my mom with my ass so bad. I don't remember what I did to get expelled, but I did something. I listen. I been three days. Yeah, I can't remember nothing. Oh, I got my ass whooped. But I went from like the whitest of like elementary schools to like the blackest. So you went from white to black. As hell. <laughs> <laughs> I was from that area, but I never went to school over there. So like when I came around, I was around like all my friends. You know what I'm saying? It was everybody looked like me, and it was just kind of dope because it was public. It was kind of like a culture shock for me. And that school that I came from wrote me a letter. The principal wrote me a letter and she was like, oh, you know, after consideration, like, we'll let you come back. You know, we change behavior, X, Y, and Z. I still want my mama, hell no, I ain't going back over there. I ain't got too used to, you know, this type of life. Were you already fast? Yeah, like I was, I, I was fast. Yeah, I was faster than my friends, but I didn't know that. I didn't really you know, know what track was. It was just, you know, I was fast. Like, so yeah, like I, and I think I didn't even run in the ninth grade. I only, I only started running in, in, in 12th grade. I was a baller, dog. I played ball. I swore I was going to the NBA. They, they, we used to always get all the Chicago games. Th those coming on Saturday and Sunday on NBC. And then also we had some Chicago channel, WGN. So that was just Jordan out, dog. I'm a LeBron guy, but we cool. I respect it. Uh, so it was nice having you on today, uh, Marvin. Um, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your... <laughs> this guy comes from LeBron talks to me, dog. Get out of here, yo. I'm talking about a serious <laughs> man here. I'm talking about Michael Jordan, man. You're throwing in some <laughs> dibby dibby you uh, in the conversation, dad. Just relax. That's, 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 that's very disrespectful. It's very, it's very disrespectful. At my high school, we had a we had a rubber we, we didn't have a rubber track. We had like the asphalt, like the rock. My high school coach, he was my track coach, and he was also like our DB coach on the football team. I think he stopped coaching because like he really wasn't like a track savant. I didn't know when, head wind, tail wind. All I knew was when, like just win the race. I don't give a damn what happens, win. My first ever 100, I ran 1082. My first ever. It was my sophomore year of high school. My uh, state champ, I won a state championship a couple weeks later. I ran 1019. That's fast, dog. Within a, like a month and a half. Dog, you made up about seven or eight meters. <laughs> no, seriously. It's, that's about how much it is, dog. Bro, with the, and this is like, this is just training with my high school coach. Like, I don't know what track and field is like that. Like, he called me the next day. He was like, dude, like, you know, LSU. Miami, Florida, they all asking about you. I'm like, what the hell you mean asking about me? He was like, yeah, they, you know, they want, they're gonna offer you a scholarship. For what? He was like, to run. She said, you ain't gotta tell me twice. Took four days later, I played in our uh, spring football game. I scored three touchdowns. And then everybody was like, oh, she played football too. I just off the spring game. I didn't play varsity. I played JV my sophomore year of high school. Officially, FSU was my first offer that they came to. And they faxed it. That's how old I am. They faxed my, uh, they faxed my offer said to this my how old is. Some of these kids don't know what fact is, man. I mean, that did date you, though. I ain't nothing what the fact is. When is it that you were working at FedEx? Uh, it was had to be 2019. 2019? At the beginning of 2019, I was playing for like this little other developmental league they had just started, but I broke my arm in like the first game, and then right then and I was like, all right, like this may not be it. And I came to terms with that so early that I was able to move past it. And I was like, all right, man, I gotta do something. I got, you know, I got a baby. I got one year old son at the time. I'm like, man, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make, I gotta make something. I gotta do something in the meantime. So, shit, I'm good at physical labor, moving boxes. So then again, I'm, while I'm doing that, I'm doing fall training. And then, like I said, January rolled around. I was like, man, I can't be doing this and still trying to race. And you know, I'm having to ask for days off and stuff like that. Like I'm just like corporate America was just not for me. Was it hard having a boss? Uh, not really, cause um, I mean, it was it was a nice. She was like cool, cool, cool lady. And actually, I don't know. Um, through some weird way, like she found out like who I was, and she actually was the one who told me. She's like, you don't, you're not supposed to be in here. 
almost got a silver medal at the World Championships. Like you're you're an Olympic gold medal threat. Do you find that people treat you differently? Not like the people that I, that, that actually know me. Like the people that actually know me, they all still treat me the same, and I, I appreciate that because I mean I'm you know I'm just me. But yeah, the respect the respect is a little different. The treatment is a little different. You know, the handshakes are a little bit more welcoming. You know, stuff like that. So yeah, it's definitely a different level of treatment. What about women? Now nah, it's always kind of been the same for me in that uh, in that regard. No, but you was, yes, you was just always a player, right? It was just you know it wasn't. Really <laughs> nah, I'm cool enough. This is this guy. <laughs> You ever had um, giant Skittles? No, I ain't never had one of those. I never liked Skittles before, but the truth, dog. Hey, what's your diet like? That's actually one of the improvements that I made. Like, I'm not, bro, when I was first competing, like my first three years, I'm pretty sure I ate at Waffle House at least like three times a week. That's my spot. You feel me? To me, it was like, I mean, I'm still out here training and I'm still out here busting ass. So why, why would I eat that? Again, these are things I didn't really understand until I walked away and I'm sitting back like, damn, maybe I should have, you know, maybe maybe a salad wouldn't have hurt it. Maybe, you know, some fish wouldn't have hurt that night, you know, and just all these things kind of like stir up in your mind. And you Like I said, if I ever get the opportunity to do that again, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it like to the best of my abilities. So now, you know, those things are cleaned up every so often. Like I'm still human. I have a burger, but for the most part, like I cook a lot at home. You cook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do my thing. Yeah. Like cook up? Yeah, yeah, no, nah, nah, I do my thing. Yeah, bro, I, I do my thing. Yeah. What's your speciality? My grandma taught me how to uh, how to fry like pork chops in a specific way. Uh, these chimeri wings that I make, um, I actually got them out of a cookbook, but like I kind of like do like my own little. Oh, my pasta! I make some Tuscan pasta that's really good. And greens, I make some collard greens too. Oh, I make some really good mac and cheese. Actually, I made um I made the mac and cheese for our group a little uh, Thanksgiving get together we had like two years ago. But they're probably surprised, huh? Like, damn, you cook this? Yeah, like, like I don't know why, like, why is it, you know, why is the consensus that I can't, you know, that I, I can't cook? It's because you're a man, and the people don't think the men can cook. That makes sense. That's that very sense. rude and it's very disrespectful. It's very, very. I cook too. My wife, my wife will laugh. She heard me say that. You really like Twitter, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's probably my favorite app. Yeah, I can tell it's your favorite. You don't, you don't do much on Instagram, but you tweet a lot. <laughs> but it's yeah. tight though because you can actually see your personality a bit more. What is it about Twitter that lets you bring yourself out more? Um, because it's just talking. You know, like when you when you got like Instagram, like people posting pictures, so they mostly post their best stuff. They like you don't get to you know engage with them. Like, but in Twitter, you it's, it's just like texting, just in public. Who, who do you think tweets well? Oh, Bernie. Bernie, <laughs> Bernie is, is probably my favorite Twitter personality. I wish that those type of people had like a bigger following in track and field because like you'll get like a different type of feel. Like Fred as well, because Fred gonna say whatever the hell, like you know that just came to his mind. Like he just picked up his phone and was like, you know, blah, 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 blah whatever it was. Right. Now Fred, right. Fred too. And then and he's going at people, so. <laughs> right. When you go out on the track, what's, is there a specific song that you like in the headphones? My first, like I got a playlist that's literally like all NBA young boy. Run it up. I got it's the violence that I feel like I need. Like I couldn't come to a track meet and listen to like calm music. Like that might like it might kill my mood. As I'm like bouncing around, like you can feel my warm up. Cause like this is like I'm literally bouncing around in my head. I'm that dude. Like I just I warm up kind of aggressively. You know what I'm saying? I sing my music. Like I you know I act out the lyrics like stuff like that. Man, it's still somewhat an aggressive sport. You know, like we just not touching each other. So you need a violent, controlled aggression, you know, as you push it down the track. Do you feel like people don't appreciate the 60 as much as they should? Oh, at all. Like, I feel like the 60 should be way more hyped up because it really is all speed. Who can like get that, the top speed the quickest, yo? It would take for more people, though, to kind of do it until we start caring about indoors, the general public won't. You know, we could be the generation of people to put, you know, indoor on. Think about it. Right now, currently, you got, she got with Marcel sitting at 641. Christian has ran, what, 34. You got Ronnie, who's ran 40. I ran 44. Trey ran 47. Like, if you could somehow get all of us to really, like, dial in, like, actually see how fast we can go indoors, like, you get, you know, you kind of hype up the event to show how fast somebody really can be because most people train through indoors and just so happen to run it and may run good, may run bad. But like, if you train for indoors, like, you know, what could we really see, you know, somebody running the 60? Since we're talking about indoors, let's go to, let's go to the race that is one of my favorite talking points with you. Guess what race that is, Marvin? Oh, you hate this race. I, I like it, but I hate it. So this is the prelims, the World Indoor Championships 2022. Marvin Bracey's in lane two. It's round one. 
Round one of three in one day of the bed 60 meter dash. We'll just let it play through the first time. And though this time look at Bracey in two and Ogan No Day looking good out there in lane six will be Marvin Bracey from Femi Ogan. I just want to clarify that at this stage, Marvin 646 was a personal best, personal record they like to say in America in the first round. The first round of three rounds in one day. Mm hmm. Now, Marvin, can you tell me how this happens in the first round of three rounds in one day? Okay, yeah, man, you, you know, man, you have, uh, we, de we debated this a couple times, but think about this, right? Okay, I ran 46, 52 got second. So I still would have had, six, had to run 651 to win. So I still would have had to run pretty fast to win this race. That's first and foremost. I'm also by myself. I think about it, the closest person to me, I can't really feel him. Like I see him out of the corner of my eye, but I don't realize that I'm that far ahead. Like it's just, it's a blur. So I was like, I don't want to chance it and slow down and something happen. You know, he get back the line or something. So I was just like, just keep pushing. This was not like intentional. I just went, I just tried to set it up. You got to realize like this race was at like 11 o'clock in the morning. So like, I was really just trying to like wake myself up. When I hit the pad and came up off, I seen the time and I was like, that, that can't be real. That ain't feel like no 646. I was like, all right, I guess that's the type of shape we in, but this is also what we had work for. My next race was like six hours later, so I knew I was gonna be fine. Is there a cue that you're going to when you're in your set position? Yes, um, I actually like, I have this cue to like, make sure that like I sweep for one and two, like take my hips with it. If you're on the ground, like I don't want to open up and kind of have that motion where like your chest kind of come up a little bit and then your body moves, you lose a little bit of time. So I was telling myself like fully extend, like, you know, take everything at once. And then I, we've been working kind of on like that step one, step two combo, just kind of getting it back down and make, making the foot come off the ground at a specific angle. You will see like it's a really hard push and that's it. that step kind of set it up. I'll push the 10 and then kind of like settle and kind of like allow myself to like transition and then, you know, kind of hit it again. And that's why the, the back halves of the race, races of certain races have been like really good. On some tracks, like, you know how like they have like the exchange zone for the four by one, like I know that that's 10 meters. And there, like it's harder because there's no lines on the track, like it's just straight blue. Right. So, and once I push and set up like that first, second step, like just transition and go from there. Whatever happens, happens. Like we'll make the corrections later. What's the consistent thing that people are always like, ah, oh, Marvin's really good at this. Or you, you know that this is like uh, one of your better qualities. My front side mechanics, like even like since like high school, have just been, it's just been natural. I've never been a butt kicker. Yeah, your knees are up there. We get to the final. I didn't have you winning still, but I was like, I wouldn't be surprised if you won now. I got you. Highly anticipated. Highly anticipated. Olympic champion, Marcel Jacobs, a defending world champion and defending world indoor champion, Christian Coleman. Now you. Marvin Bracey got a silver eight years ago. Could he upset the world champion and the Olympic champion? You had a really good chance of winning this. I swear I thought I was going to win it, bro. <laughs> Set. They're safely away. Bracey got a good start. Lamont Jacobs trying to get into his running. Christian Coleman's up at the moment. Oh, it's so, so close. It's so, so close. Is it? Is it the Olympic champion from the world champion just? Okay. I mean, the race was close. But did, wait, what are you feeling? What are you feeling? You felt something. I can see it. What are you feeling as you're watching now? Yeah, nah, that's some bullshit, bro. <laughs> nah, that's some bullshit, man. We, was, we were supposed to be, One of us had to win that race, dog. So from a USA standpoint, you're thinking of that. We just quiet. Just quiet, dog. And he turned around and looked at me, and I just looked at him like, yeah, bro. <laughs> we let that happen, dog. And what a climax to a gripping night in Belgrade. Coleman relinquishes his crown. Bracey takes the bronze with a massive PB. Uh, and when you watch races, do you watch them feeling like it's going to turn out different? Yeah, man. It's like, it's like, because you, you, you just, you looking at it, like, and you know, like, what you should be doing. But, like, in that moment, it happens so fast, man. And when, like, you don't hit a certain position or a certain cue or something, like, and you realize you're about to lose, like, it's, it's just you can do better. 
at about 40, I'm like, oh, yeah, I see, I feel Christian gone. I'm like, all right, man, just stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. I kind of felt myself kind of move a little bit, but then like the last 10 meters, bro, Marcel just hit a step. He hit, I'm talking about two of the cleanest stuff. Bang, bang, got to the finish line. I was like, oh, hell no. I mean, you, you see, just look at the knee positions, man. He went to move him. You usually don't back kick, but uncharacteristically, you got behind yourself. Uncharacteristic. But that's why I say, like, you know, the 60 really does deserve more respect because more of that, you know, kind of happens. And uh, in a hundred, like, you know, I would have obviously stayed more relaxed and been able to just kind of, you know, go through positions at the back end of the race. But you know that line is coming and, like, you got to make a move. For me, I've never had a problem running in a big moment. Like, actually, that's when I ran my best, like, in a bigger in a bigger moment. Most of my PBs come from like some type of championship or something. But like for me, man, like even though I didn't win the World Indoors, like people don't realize I ran 644. I'm not like eighth or ninth all the time. It just, it took 641 to beat me like shit. I mean. <laughs> we get outside, uh, you make the USA team. And obviously that's a big deal to make the US team in the 100 meters. Right. We get to the World Championships, but we get to the finals. Okay. Yes, sir. Option year. Baby on the way. <laughs> One thing that I've always wanted to experience but haven't experienced, only in some smaller races like Pan Ams, relays, and shit like that, the call room in our international final. Are you able to explain the tension in the, in the call room? I mean, as cliche as it, as it goes, um, I mean, you could say, I could say the tension is so thick, like you really could cut through the air with like a butter knife. Like it was such a like cold area. Like even though it was hot outside, being in the call room, it felt kind of cold. You know what I'm saying? Like it was like, it was in a different part of like the whole venue. It's kind of dark in there. They don't got no lights in there. Small space. Yeah, it's a small space and everybody's warmed up in like different areas. So we're all within like, you know, basically our arms reaching like the next person. But the first time you, the first call room you in, is like, it's the first time y'all really seeing each other, like, as, like, a collective. You making eye contact? Um, with certain people, yeah, if they look at me, I look at them. Very tense, though. It's tense as hell, yeah. <laughs> but, like, walking out to the track, man, it was just, like, it's just like a now and never thing, man. Like, it's, it's no turning back. I'm asking myself to do this one time, like, just run fast one time, like, something you've done for the last 10 months. These are the type of conversations I have with myself when I go out there. All I'm asking you to do is do it one more time. One chance for glory and greatness. 10 seconds to justify a lifetime of work. And whatever happens, happens. The men's 100 metre world championship final. They're away first time. There's a massive roar from the crowd. Coleman's going well out in lane seven. Still no move yet from Curly. Gracie going well. Curly's under pressure. Oh, and it's so tight. Did Curly get it on the line? Or has Marvin Gracie beaten him to the title? I think. Did you know you lost? No, I didn't. I didn't know yet. It was that much of a blur. I like, I like this side view because it gives some really good perspective as far as what was going on. How did this become a silver medal? So the way I approach track, I kind of approach it with like, you know, like a, a football upbringing in the sense of like watching film. If you go back and look at the USA Championship at like 35, 40 meters, me and Trey like up and running. And you can still see Fred kind of like come out of his drive. I watched that race a shit ton of times. And I'm like, OK, he's going to do the same thing again. He's going to transition at about 40 and like come up out of it. I said, okay, so Marvin, this time, like, hold it, hold it, hold it. So, like, go with him, like, drive as long as him, and, and you know, you'll get a step. If you go back and look at this race, we were both driving to about the same point. Like, our head came up at the same time. And I was like, okay, go. And that was the step. I'm like, okay, at this point, I'm like, oh, shit, I got it. Like, this is, this is, this is how you, this is how you set it up. So, at this point, you're like, oh, there it is. <laughs> So everything's going according to plan. Everything was going to plan according to plan. At USA is at about 80 is where like he pulled away from us. So I was like, okay, at about 80, he's going to make that move. Get to 80. And I saw the line and instead of like letting it come to me, I just tried to grab it. Fred's very disrespectful. Calls you Mr. 97. That's 97 meters right there. It's very disrespectful. Very disrespectful. <laughs> I processed all of that 
within like the victory lap in the sense that so first it was like nobody really understood at that time like what you know what just happened it's an option year baby on the way you know back against the wall like you don't have you it's, it's like this is literally do or die right now like this is going to dictate so many things for the future so when I got the medal and then I realized it was also a silver and it was that close I'm like okay now like everything just got so much better and it wasn't until I start I got the medal around my neck and I started walking around and I'm just seeing him you know go around and celebrate and I'm like damn I I was so close so close it's just more motivational man like I was you know, like again, like we talked about earlier, last year I didn't make the team. This year we this close, you know. Next year we just gotta improve and we'll win. Did you really care about losing the relay? Pride wise, hell yeah. Like we it, it was at home, bro. Like it would have been so big, you know, for us. But at the end of the day, the relay's fun, but they don't respect the relay either. Like they 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 gave us, you know, all this flack about it. So it's like, yeah, from, from a pride standpoint, you know, representing the home country, yeah, I want to win. Obviously, you want to win every race, but it ain't gonna, like it was going to do anything for me, like, especially in America. Like, y'all, I, mean, I see y'all throw a parade and shit. Like, what's that about? Um, <laughs> but, all right, but y'all doing too much. <laughs> Lincoln no parade. We show up the one, the two, and the, the throws. Like, Lincoln no parade. What can the U.S. relay team do to get the results that they should be getting? It's just it's simple. It's simple handoffs, bro. Like you just got to be now. Nah, you just got. It's just getting four competent people out there and just all on the one accord and getting the job done. You know, teams that don't really have baton issues that are usually the teams that are always together. Like we're only here for the day. Like we not when we after today we back rivals again. We don't run together every year and kind of build like that. It's about trust. Like, you got to actually trust the guy there in front of you. And if you don't really know him like that, you know, think about the USA teams over the course of the last couple of years. It's been so different. In 2019, Fred was running the 400. I wasn't in the sport. And Trey was running 10-5. It's very different. <laughs> Maurice Green. If Marvin, if you don't really understand who Maurice Green is, you're going to have to start YouTubing. I know who Maurice Green is. Maurice, I talk to him all the time. making sure it died because I just... You talk to him? <laughs> yeah, all the time, man. You're talking about your relationship with Maurice, Doc. In 2011, Adidas used to have the, the Diamond League at Icon Stadium in New York, right? The Adidas Diamond League, whatever it was. I came to the first inaugural one. It was a Dream 100. They took the top eight 100 meter fastest kids in high school and flew them into New York. And we ran the same day as like Tyson and all of them. I never forget, I mean, we went into a room and Maurice Green walked in. I'm like, oh shit, that's, you know, I, I knew who he was. And he was just talking to us or whatever. And like before he started like the real, like going to the spiel, he was like, hey man, um, I got one question though. Who's about to win this race? And like my hand shot up. And like, I looked around the room and like I was the only person with my hand up. And I just kind of slowly like brought it back down. And he was like, no, 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 keep your hand up. No, that's what you're here to do. You're here to win. So I, he always remembered me from that. I talk to him all the time, man, and just kind of like pick his brain, you know, ask him what he was thinking at various points in the race. Like, you, you know, you asked me. And just getting his cues, you know, seeing what I can and cannot, you know, pluck from. Maurice, we were wondering when you were going to get your swagger back. I think you got it. As long as I'm healthy, anything's possible. Yeah, my coach can teach me so much, but I'm you know, talking to somebody that actually feels it, that does it, is a little bit of a, a different feel. People need to remember who this guy was. As they come to the line, Maurice Green, Maurice Green wins for the United States. The U.S. is back. This guy was... Unbelievable, Doug. Unbelievable. I can tell you right now what the U.S. relay team needs. Maurice needs to be the relay coach. But he had a famous quote. In order to be number one, you have to train like you're number two. And right now, you're number two. Yeah.